My next guest became a viral sensation when a video of his work with young men and their fathers in his program, The Cave of Abdulam Transformational Training Academy, got the attention of the whole world. Watch this. I didn't have my father either, okay? But here I am. Because I had God the Father. His word says he'll be a father to the fatherless. And what he did for me, he supplied men along the journey to help keep me up during my most critical years of my life. And then when I was able to stand on my own, Caden, he told me to go back and get my father. So it may be some years before that relationship gets right, but I know he loves you, and you should keep praying for him, because I love him, I care about him. Maybe when he see this, it'll move his heart. Welcome, Jason. Jason, you were in that video. I, it gets me teary yeah, when hard, I... It's hard to look at even to this day, yeah. What, why is that so important? Um, well, personally, I grew up without my father. Uh, we were in the same city, uh, but he wasn't there. And um, just imagining not knowing that the one who you technically came from mm -hmm. um, doesn't really care to be around you. Um, and then you start seeking affirmation from other places like gangs and uh, maybe guys who really don't have uh, the right uh, future ahead of them or the desires ahead of them, you know. And so uh, their desires are tainted by evil thoughts more so than righteous ones. And so uh, when I see Caden and other young boys, it hurts me because I know the feeling. I know the longing to have uh, a man, specifically your father there, cheering you on and encouraging you, or when you fail, someone who won't condemn you, but will encourage you. And so it's so important uh, for a young boy to have a father that even God the Father, mm. yeah. you know, when Christ was being baptized, when he came out the water, he affirmed his son. Mm. Even on a deeper level, he knew it was so important, because we know Christ is the incarnate, is God in the flesh, that he affirmed himself, and that's how important affirmation is for a young boy and a man, in, uh, you know, period, yeah. And I think what you said is so key. There's a difference between being a father and just being a person that mm. donated sperm. Yes, yes. There's a difference between being present in a home and actually interacting yes. with your child. You're, you grew up in a middle-class yes. family. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, but as your parents divorced and your father kind of distanced himself, you found yourself um, just delving into different areas. Yes. Can you share that? Yeah, I um, was searching for identity, yeah. you know, who I was, um, especially, you know, when I became, I think, uh, 12 years old, sexuality, puberty, trying to find out what's going on with me. Mm -hmm. And so it just opened the door for Satan to say, hey, this is what sex is. Mm -hmm. This is what pornography is. Mm -hmm. uh, I would steal X-rated magazines just for the affirmation uh, of a woman. Mm -hmm. Because remember, my mother, from in the book, my mother lost uh, a son, my brother. Mm -hmm. And so she was guarded mm -hmm. and couldn't really love me. And well, she loved me but couldn't really express it because she says, no, God, I can't lose another, another son. Mm -hmm. And um, But she tried her best to... Um, she did her best, mm -hmm. but here it is as a young boy in his room closing the door and stealing Playboy magazines, and I didn't have a man to show me, hey, no, like Solomon says, son, do not disperse your streams of water in the streets. Save your love only for the wife of your youth. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand. He was saying, don't disperse your sperm. Yeah. What good is it to have sex with anyone? And so many boys are, are, are at this crossroad right now, especially because of the culture, when I grew up, virginity was, you were an outcast. It's like, whoa, you know, what's wrong with you, brother? You tell the story of even yeah. your family yeah. making oh, fun yeah, of yeah. you. And, and, and my cousin, literally, I'm like, uh, we go over uh, his girlfriend's house and she has a sister. 
And um, I'm nervous. You know, I never, you know, uh, I would kiss girls, but I, I knew them at, at my school in Detroit. Mm -hmm. But I'm in Florida, another state, didn't know this girl, but she was cute. And I was nervous. Mm -hmm. And make a long story short, when we on the ride home, he says, hey, you didn't get none? Mm -hmm. I'm like, no. As Soon as we walk in the house with my aunties, uncles, everyone there, he said, hey, everybody, Jason ain't never had none. And the whole house uh, laughs at me, mm -hmm. even my mom. And at that point, I say, this will never happen to me again. I was on a mission to lose my virginity. I didn't even care who it was with. Mm, you started to build up walls. We're going to take a quick break, and we will uh, continue our conversation with Jason Wilson. Stay with us. We're back with my guest, Jason Wilson, the author of this great new book, Cry Like a Man, Fighting for Freedom from Emotional Incarceration. You shared how these walls continued to go up. I want to read a little excerpt from your book, page uh, 56. 56. After a decade of men coming and going, loving and hating, encouraging and berating, I had barricaded myself in an invisible yet impenetrable fortress. Walls of defense that seemed to go up automatically, brick by tedious brick, until one day I was sealed inside alone. Mm -hmm. Walls, the great escape within the prison of my own making. Mm -hmm. I don't imagine that this is just your story. This is a story of many men. Yes. Why do these walls continue to go up? What is society telling men that is causing them to build these walls? Well, um, we've bought the lie of what I call misconstrued masculinity, mm -hmm. basically a misunderstanding of what masculinity is. It's a limited definition, you know. Um, attributes tradi traditionally ascribed to men like boldness and strength. And, you know, what about the attributes uh, ascribed to being a human? You know, we weren't just created a man, we were created to be a human. You know, like love, compassion, you know, and so my desire is that we would shed, uh, would stop allowing masculinity to define us and become more comprehensive men of the Most High, being able to be strong but sensitive, courageous but compassionate. And when we become comprehensive, we can start living from our heart instead of our hurt. You know, in life, there's going to be things harder for you to do than other things. And you know, those things that may appear to be hard to do, you're going to have to do as a man regardless. And it's going to take tears. It's going to take the blood of Yeshua, Jesus, and your sweat to break through it. Do you understand? Yes, sir. So I don't mind you crying. I cry a lot, too. You know what I'm saying? All right? So I want you to just to, you're pulling your blow. I don't know if you're facing fear or you're feeling that you may not make it. And we all face that from time to time. And when we face, as soon as we have resistance, we want to stop, right? Because it's hurting for that pain. We're like, I'm not going through this no more, right? Exactly. We have to go off with those men. This is going to be very painful. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Being a black man in this country, you're going to need mental fortitude. You're going to have to be strong here more so than here. You understand? Yes, sir. Um, you talk about allowing Jesus to enter mm -hmm. into your heart yes. later on. Tell mm -hmm. us about that moment and how that transformed your perspective. I, uh, I was running. Uh, for many years, uh, I was being called by Christ, and uh, I didn't want to believe. See, in my community, uh, they called it the white man's religion, mm -hmm. Christianity. And uh, so I started studying other religions, and it brought me back to studying who Christ was. And I said, okay, wait a minute. I know there's only one God. I said, but I need you to show me because someone just preaching me this Bible is not going to help me because at that time, Christians didn't really, many Christians didn't know their word. Mm. So I studied it to rebuke them mm. with their own word because I knew they didn't know it. Mm. And so after two near-death experiences, the last one, uh, I found myself at a loading dock with a, a high load next to me and I'm crying. And I said, Father, I will never turn against you. And at that point, I gave my life to him, and he, I felt an immediate flush of his love, and like, look, it's going to be a journey, it's going to be challenge, challenging, but I'm here for you. Okay. And as I fast forward to now, and what I went through with caring for my mother, praying to be broken, if I would have never had a relationship with Christ, I would have never prayed to be broken. No one comes to the Father, he draws us, mm -hmm. but I still felt that these emotions, the way I was feeling, was hindering him from using me completely without restriction. Mm -hmm. And so the wall started coming down as he began to show me not only what he didn't like, but what he created me to be. Yeah. So. 
When did that moment come of release when you felt like I could cry? You tell a story about being at your, mm, the funeral yeah. of your friend. Yeah, when I lost my best friend, Daryl, um, beautiful brother, 41, uh, walked him to Christ, showed him who, the door, and mm -hmm. he walked through it, and he dies before me. Mm -hmm. And massive heart attack, and I'm at the funeral, and I looked at my pastor at the time, I said, hey, I feel like crying. Mm -hmm. and he looked at me, he says, well, cry. Mm -hmm. That was the first time a man had ever given me permission to cry. And I cried and I cried and I felt better because I had to speak. And so many men were holding our breath because we feel that if we let these emotions out, we'll be an outcast, we'll be talked about. But many men don't know that when we cry, we release stress hormones, that's why we feel better. So to tell a man that he can't cry is telling him not to be human. You cut off half his humanity, and then we wonder why we commit a suicide more than our women. Mm. You know, the majority of violent crimes are by men. Mm. And it's like, it's time out, and men are tired of not being able to say they're tired. We're, we're like, wait a minute, something is wrong because I'm not, why don't I have patience when I come home for my family? Mm. You know, we've, we've, we've put this cape on, and it is strangling us. And the problem is superheroes have emotions as well. No one can do it all. No one can be strong all the time. It's impossible. And just that burden alone would drive anyone insane. And so now you just oppose yourself against something that no one can be? And you live that life? No wonder so many of us, we turn towards you know, uh, alcohol, drugs, um, uh, uh, pornography, you name it, a dangerous lifestyle, because we know something is wrong, but we don't have the freedom to express it. What can women in men's lives do to help? Mm. Um, listen, mm. um, my wife is, this was new for her. I mean, this is like uh, revolutionary, you know. Um, when I first started crying in front of my wife, um, I saw a different woman, mm. a nurturer. Um, I lost my mother in 2016, and although it is written that a uh, husband and wife should leave their parents and, so they can become one flesh, uh, God never designed us to not have the nurturing love of a, a mother. And we have to understand that God gave Adam a uh, responsibility, but he gave Eve a relationship. And so with that being said, as a man, when we're able to open up to our wives, we're welcoming the nurturing. Mm. But the nurturing has to be compassion, not condemnation. A man should be, after he sheds his last, as after a woman wipes his tear, he should still feel like a warrior. Mm. He should still feel like he can still protect and provide, but also that he can trust her enough with his heart that he can confide in her. Mm. And so I would say the main thing our women need to, to be for us, our wives, is to listen, to be nurturers. Um, I could imagine if I was a fly on the wall and you're in a conversation with one of your girlfriends, mm -hmm. you know, um, you'll listen to her. Mm -hmm. That's what we need as men. And, and the floodgates are going to open um, once they uh, read this book and start seeing themselves in my journey. They're going to cry a lot mm -hmm. because you have years of emotional wounds and trauma that have not been released. It's like when the dam bursts. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of water. It's not just a drop or a little river. There's a gushing amount, large amounts of water. And we have to be patient enough until the last drop is out. And that's the key. So to listen and to be patient. I know that there are probably men watching that are saying, yes, Jason, yeah. this is what I've been, this is what has been boiled up inside of me. What are some words of um, encouragement that you can give a man watching right now? I would tell um, every man watching now to uh, don't give up. Mm -hmm. Instead, give up what's causing you to give up. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we um, allow our circumstances to dictate our future. And so I would tell every man right now is to learn how to express your emotions with someone you trust. Stop going at it alone. Uh, it's not wise, it's Proverbs 18.1, it's not wise to isolate ourselves mm -hmm. because we, we rebel against wisdom. But it's wise for us to seek counsel for there is victory. So I would tell all my brothers who are watching and listening, stop holding it in, get out of isolation 
and expose what's really going on and you will be free. Mm -hmm. uh, transparency set me free. I have nothing to prove anymore. Mm -hmm. I have, uh, I may feel a little nervous before an interview, but at the end of the day, I'm free. Whatever happens, whatever word is not pronounced, I'm a human and I can make mistakes. The only worst mistake, the worst mistake you can make is not learning from it. Mm. Mistakes are great teachers. Mm. And so to be free, to be human, be transparent, and, and start expressing yourself. Even uh, a practice I do with my men is that when there's conflict and I'm a mediator, I say, well, wait a minute, you're angry but that's a result of something deeper. Mm -hmm. Tell him what's going on, tell him he hurt you. And men are like, oh, what, what you mean? Tell this brother he hurt you. Mm -hmm. Freedom. Yeah. So that's, that's where we need to start. I wish we had so much more time, Jason. Thank Me you too. so yeah. much. Again, the book is called Cry Like a Man, Fighting for Freedom from Emotional Incarceration. I just wanna read these words on page 202 that Jason wrote. For decades, I thought power was based on how much weight you could lift, how many men you could knock out. Now I realize anyone untrained can lift a dumbbell or break a, break a jaw, but real power is when a man can navigate through the pressures of this world without succumbing to his negative emotions, to feel something painful and not push it away, to cry, just cry like a man. I hope that's an encouragement to you today. Maybe you've been holding in a lot of that pain. Maybe you feel like a man, being a man means I shouldn't cry, I shouldn't show emotion. I love what Jason said, with that comes freedom. Knowing that your earthly father might not have represented what your heavenly father represents, but that he is there and he is willing to grab your hand and say, you're okay. Uh, the prayer lines are at the bottom of our screen. Amazing prayer partners that would love to pray with you, encourage you, and remind you that you are loved today. Stay with us, we'll be right back.